Hey guys, and welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Yes, it's time to talk about the Samsung Galaxy S8 Plus. So this is the company's new flagship Android smartphone for 2017. There's a ton of interesting new features to talk about. So this could be a long one, so stay tuned. But before I get into any of the features or anything like that, I do want to mention that because I live in Australia, of course, I've been sent an Exynos model of the S8 Plus. If you're in North America, you will be given a variant with the Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 SoC inside. But for us in the rest of the world, including Europe and Australia, uh, it's the Exynos 8895 SoC, so a bit different from some of those United States reviews that you might be seeing out there. We'll be talking all about the performance of the Exynos model exclusively in this review, simply because I haven't had any hands-on time with the other variant. Oh, and just before we get any further, keep in mind that all the benchmarks that we'll be showing you guys a little later are also available to view in TechSpot's written review over on TechSpot.com, including some benchmarks that we don't put in this video. So head over there after you've checked out the whole video here uh, for more content available on the Galaxy S8+. Plus. Anyway, onto the show because we need to talk about the design of this handset and there's a lot of things to like about it and obviously one big downside as well to talk about. So the main thing to notice with the Galaxy S8 Plus of course is the screen to body ratio. Samsung has gone basically removed the bezels on the smartphone entirely to slot in that 6.2 inch AMOLED display that occupies almost the entire front panel. They've removed the navigation buttons along the bottom edge instead going with on-screen navigation buttons and they've significantly shrunk the bezel at the top of the screen even though it still includes things like the sensor, notification LED, speaker and front facing camera. You still get all those features but the screen simply takes up so much of the front of this handset that it looks extremely futuristic. You really don't notice how dated and ugly other smartphones look with their massive bezels until you get your hands on the Galaxy S8 Plus. This is a futuristic design trend that other companies will need to imitate to keep up with the pack. I don't want to see big bezels on phones anymore now that I've used the Galaxy S8 Plus. Of course you also see those curved display edges. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of those personally, I think they add a bit of distortion to the display experience, but it certainly looks awesome when you sort of take it out of the box and go, wow, you know, that's the phone's curved, it's got glass on either side, it looks fantastic. And that translates into the rest of the build of this handset. I mean, it's metal around the edges, it looks and feels great in your hands. Glass fully on the back, again, gives you that premium look while still allowing wireless charging to be a thing in this handset. And the build quality, it's seamless, it's fantastic, and it's such a big step up from what we used to see from Samsung in phones like the Galaxy S5. They revolutionized their design language with the Galaxy S6, and they've refined it incredibly in the Galaxy S8 Plus to make this the best looking phone you can get on the market at the moment. The one downside though that comes with making a phone with these materials and this build is that as Steve mentioned in his video where he ranted about his own Galaxy S8 Plus, this is an incredibly fragile phone. We've seen reports all over the internet that discuss how, you know, phone repair shops are going crazy because they're making tons of money on people who are buying S8 Pluses or S8s, dropping them within the first week and the screen shattering. One of the reasons for this is due to that curved edge, it doesn't add a lot of uh, rigidity to the design if you drop it on your desk on the edge. Uh, there's a chance that the weak glass in that area will shatter and also glass on the back. That's another weak point of the phone. Drop it on the back and that glass could shatter as well. On top of that, it's extremely slippery uh, because you've got the oleophobic coating on both sides to attempt to prevent fingerprints. It's still a fingerprint magnet. Uh, it, it slips out of your hand like nothing else. It slides along desks. There's not much of a rim around the edges. You do get that metal there that gives you a bit of grip, but it's just not slim, it's just not large enough on those edges to make it easy to hold the device. Uh, it'll, if it slips out of your hand, you're pretty much ruined. So uh, that is one thing to know. It's a bit disappointing because Samsung has clearly made the most attractive smartphone body on the market. But at the same time, you're spending you know, 800 bucks on the phone and you wanna keep it secure for the entire time that you're using it. And with the S8 Plus, that means you pretty much need to get a case. So you've got that awesome design, but at the other hand, you need a case that makes it look ugly and pretty crap uh, to prevent it from breaking. It's a bit of a downside for, as far as the S8 Plus is concerned and kind of hinders my recommendation of it a little bit. If you're willing to put up with the case, you get some great features, but at the end of the day, I'd really want to see that design in all of its glory without it being so fragile. 
There's another issue with the Galaxy 8 Plus's design, and that is the position of the fingerprint sensor, which is simply pretty dumb. I mean, what were Samsung's engineers thinking, putting the fingerprint sensor right next to the camera lens? Uh, whenever you go to activate the fingerprint sensor, you'll be putting grimy fingerprints all over the camera lens, and that can impact the camera quality quite significantly after a couple of attempts of hitting that sensor. So uh, it would have made a lot more sense to put the fingerprint sensor below the camera so that you're not constantly griming up the camera and having to clean it all the time. Uh, yeah, it's just a pretty dumb move as far as that's concerned. You do get a bunch of great features throughout the S8 Plus's design though. USB-C is included on the bottom for the first time. Uh, Samsung's Gear VR headset has held back the S7 Edge from coming with the uh, USB-C port, but you get that on the S8 Plus for the first time. You still get the 3.5mm audio jack. Phones that don't have that are simply stupid. Uh, it's fully water resistant to IP68, so you can use it underwater in fresh water. Don't use it in salt water, it will corrode the phone, but aside from that, you know, it's splash resistant and all of that. You get a tray on the top for your nano SIM and also a micro SD card, so you still get expandable storage in this handset. The notification LED, I still love that feature about phones. Uh, you need an LED notification LED in all Android handsets, to be honest. And yeah, the speaker that's included on the bottom are uh, not too great in terms of its quality, but it does go pretty loud. I still prefer, you know, dual front facing speakers on your phone, but when you're sacrificing the bezels, uh, you know, you probably can't fit too much of a speaker setup in there. So I forgive Samsung a little bit for that one. This display is obviously one of the key areas that Samsung has upgraded from the S7 Edge. We're now seeing a 6.2 inch Super AMOLED with a resolution of 2960 by 1440. So an 18.5 to nine aspect ratio, making this display much taller than you'd normally see on a traditional smartphone. Compared to the S7 Edge, it's 17% larger. The main thing that's changed here is the height of the display. Obviously you get 400 extra pixels of vertical height. The width of the two displays, 5.5 inches on the S7 Edge and obviously 6.2 inches here. It's pretty similar in terms of its width, but again, it just, Samsung has expanded the display vertically to occupy more of the front of the handset. And I think that that is an excellent choice because screen to body ratio is all the rage these days. In terms of usability, even though this display is taller and larger than last year's model, I still found it easy to hold and operate this phone. Uh, I think the width is usually the limiting factor here for display usability, so the extra height doesn't make a significant difference here. Most Android applications support the expanded aspect ratio perfectly fine by default. For those that are locked to 16.9, Samsung has a handy toggle that lets you expand the app to use the full display, and this works pretty much perfectly in all the times that I had to use it. The main benefit to having the taller display, despite it using more of the handset's profile, is it does make it easy to use the split screen mode that's included in Android 7.0. You can see a bit more of each application on the screen at any one time. Although one of the downsides, I guess, is that if you're watching a video that's shot in 16.9, like most videos on YouTube or whatever, you will see black bars on either side of the display. You can zoom in the video so that it occupies the full 18.5 to nine uh, display aspect ratio, but that crops the top and bottom of the video. Not too keen on that, so I tended to just put up with the black bars on either side, but I can't see most people making content 18.5 to 9 aspect ratio, so this is an issue that will plague all phones that decide to use that expanded uh, you know, display aspect ratio, though I still would put up with that considering just how awesome the display looks on this handset. When looking at display performance, Samsung is still a leader in terms of their Super AMOLED technology. We're getting the traditional benefits of AMOLED tech, like its deep, deep black levels that lead to an infinite contrast ratio, which really make colors pop on this display. Uh, viewing angles are fantastic, as is the case with all AMOLEDs. Viewing this display at off angles, you get almost no color shift. And the main benefit, something that Samsung has managed to engineer really well in the AMOLEDs, is a high peak brightness. Over 570 nits in the S8 Plus makes this display very easy to view outside. Traditional AMOLEDs tend to sit in more of the 300 to 400 nit peak brightness range, but I guess Samsung doesn't worry about power consumption and just pushes it straight to the max in the S8 Plus. It's almost LCD territory in terms of that particular aspect. In terms of color accuracy, this isn't an area that Samsung tends to calibrate out of the box. They go for a gamut that's outside of sRGB, which leads to an oversaturated display in general. Uh, of course, that leads to poor color accuracy because uh, Android has no color management to speak of. If the gamut is outside sRGB, you'll be seeing oversaturated and too vibrant imagery, but I think that tends to look really awesome on a smartphone, and it's something that most people look for when they're looking at a display. You know, they pick up a, a phone in the store or whatever to test out 
and they go, wow, you know, that, that display looks awesome, it's vibrant, it's beautiful, and you know, that's pretty much what most people want, so I guess you can kind of forgive the poor accuracy and uh, in terms of, you know, our saturation and color checker results there. However, for those that do need their phone to have a color accurate display, whether that's creative professionals developing apps or something like that, Samsung does have a basic display mode that you can switch to that improves the color accuracy significantly. It tends to make the operating system look pretty crap because Samsung uh, designs their operating system for the vibrant display, but it pulls back in the saturation, color check, and grayscale performance significantly. It's not super accurate. I'd prefer to see a delta E value of under two in most of these tests, like on the Galaxy S7 Edge, but it still is a big change from the default color performance mode. It's also worth talking about a feature I haven't seen in phones before, and that is the resolution toggle. Out of the box, this phone is set to the FHD Plus mode, so that's a 1080p equivalent uh, display resolution here. You will want to push that up to the full 2960 by 1440 resolution as soon as you get it because it does give you that extra sharpness and clarity when viewing things like photos and text. Moving on to the performance now, and as I mentioned earlier, there are two variants of the S8 Plus available, one with the Snapdragon 835 that I won't be talking about at all, so go watch another video or something if you're interested in the performance of that variant. But what I do have with me is the variant with the Exynos 8895 SoC inside. So the main upgrade here in terms of last year's model, the Galaxy S7 Edge that used the Exynos 8890, is a shift from a 14 nanometer to a 10 nanometer manufacturing node, so increased efficiency and slightly better performance there. We're still seeing an octa-core design split into two quad-core clusters. The high-performance cluster uses Exynos M1 CPU cores clocked it up to 2.3 gigahertz in the S8 Plus, and the energy-efficient cluster that's used for low-performance tasks is ARM Core Cortex A53 CPU cores clocked it up to 1.7 gigahertz here. In terms of GPU, we're looking at a Mali G71 MP20 with a clock of 546 megahertz, so a big upgrade on the Exynos 8890. Also seeing an LPDDR4X memory controller uh, that's attached to four gigabytes of RAM in the Galaxy S8 Plus, and we're also seeing 64 gigabytes of NAND. We're seeing LTE category 16 for the first time in an Exynos chip, so that means uh, you get gigabit LTE downstream. Uh, category 13 upstream, we're also seeing Bluetooth 5 in a smartphone for the first time. Wi-Fi 802.11, uh, AC, NFC, all the stuff that you're after in a high-end phone you're getting in this particular device. As we move to benchmarks, because that's of course what you guys are interested in, and taking a look at how the Exynos 8895 performs across our range of CPU limited workloads, it's around 22% faster than the S7 Edge with its 8890 in those CPU limited system benchmarks, despite having a lower clock speed on the high performance cores. Samsung does say that we should be seeing a 27% performance improvement. It's a little bit lower than that across the board, but it still leads to a very snappy experience in everyday tasks. Although, you probably won't notice a big difference if you're moving just from the S7 Edge. Compared to a device with the Snapdragon 821, like the Pixel XL, it's around 20% faster on average. However, uh, the Huawei Mate 9, which includes a Kirin 960 SoC, the S8 Plus falls short by around 6%. The uh, Cortex-A73 CPU cores used in the Kirin 960 tend to be a bit more powerful than the M2s that we're seeing in the 8895. But both of these phones, you know, are very strong contenders here. If you're upgrading from a two-year-old Exynos-powered Galaxy S6, you'll enjoy a 37% better CPU performance, so decent results there. When looking at GPU workloads, again, the Mali G71 MP20 is a big upgrade on last year's model. We're seeing a 60% faster GPU compared to the Galaxy S7 Edge with the Exynos chip inside. Pretty massive performance difference here, and when you're limiting to just on-screen benchmarks, the S8 Plus still holds a 54% performance advantage over the S7 Edge despite its increased resolution. Compared to phones with the Snapdragon 821 inside, gains are a bit smaller and around the 39% performance improvement. Still pretty impressive compared to Qualcomm's last generation silicon and compared to the Mate 9's Kirin 960, which also uses a Mali G71, but only the MP8 variant. Uh, the S8 Plus pulls away by around 32% on average. And in general, the uh, S8 Plus here with the G71 MP20 tends to perform around the same mark as the iPhone 7 Plus, and we know how powerful Apple's GPU is in their A10 SoC. 
Unfortunately, I don't have enough data to compare the 8895 to a Snapdragon 835 SoC at the moment, so you'll have to check back on Hardware Unbox soon because I do have an 835 device to take a look at shortly. One of the main issues with Samsung's Exynos SoCs has always been throttling, and that is no exception, unfortunately, with the S8 Plus. We're still seeing after about 25 minutes of an intensive gaming workload that the uh, GPU inside the Exynos 8895 throws by over 40%, which reduces the performance pretty significantly. It still does outperform chips like the Snapdragon 821 after it, you know, throttling for its chip is factored in, but I'd really prefer to see the throttling uh, fall within the range of Qualcomm's chips, which tend to be more in the 20 to 30% range, 40% is a lot, and I think Samsung needs to work on that a little bit in their variant that they are shipping to most international customers. In terms of NAND performance, uh, they have improved the sequential performance a bit compared to the S7 Edge, getting very solid sequential results here. However, random results still, still fall sort of middle of the pack. I'd like to see better random performance that would improve some of the you know, app loading, app writing to storage sort of uh, works, workloads that we see in smartphones. A bit disappointing the random performance here, but you know, Generally using the S8 Plus, it's a very snappy device and applications load extremely quickly. It's a top end phone. You've got to expect good performance and that's what we're seeing across the board here. Samsung has paired great performance with great battery life in the S8 Plus. Hopefully we're not going to see any explosions this time around, but we are seeing a 3500 milliamp hour battery here, slightly smaller than the 3600 milliamp hour cell that we saw in the S7 Edge, but thanks to the increased efficiency of the 10 nanometer SoC, battery life tends to be around the same mark as the S7 Edge. Uh, in some of our benchmarks, like our web browsing tests, it falls a little bit behind, and in other tests, it can pull a little bit ahead, so it just depends on the metric that you're looking at, but generally very good performance across the board. Compared to one of my favorite phones on the market, the Google Pixel XL, the S8 Plus lasts around 10% longer on average, and that's a very strong result here. It's great to see good battery life in a high-end phone. We don't want to see them going for something that's too slim and negating battery life entirely. The S8 Plus will last you all day, no worries. One thing to note, though, this is important. The S8 Plus uses an always-on display. This is pretty handy. You get to see things like your time and notifications all the time. But leaving this feature on does impact your standby battery life, which is not reflected in these charts. I like having the feature enabled. It's great. It gives me information at my fingertips whenever I pull my phone out of my pocket or whatever. But it will reduce your standby battery life. So if you do want to get your phone to last as long as possible, you will have to disable that feature out of the box. I feel like I've been sitting here and talking for ages on the S8 Plus, but there's definitely still more to get through, most notably the camera. Samsung has done something unusual here in that they haven't upgraded the camera sensor from the S7 Edge. We're still seeing the same 12 megapixel sensor with 1.4 micron pixels with optical image stabilization and an f1.7 lens. So we're still getting the same dual pixel technology. And what that means is that along with the light detecting pixel in the sensor, every single pixel is also paired with the phase detection detection unit, meaning that focusing speeds are pretty much unparalleled. You put your phone up to a subject and it's focused almost immediately on the S8 Plus. That's one of the great features about this camera. One of the things Samsung has improved is the processing. They've tweaked it slightly, and I think the main thing that is upgraded here is its dynamic range. You get photos with a bit more depth in them and improved performance in sort of your indoor artificial lighting settings and at low light. Bit of improvement there in terms of its dynamic range. You still get fantastic results across the board. Photos taken with the S8 Plus look great if they're outdoors. They look pretty good when it's indoors. Cameras tend to suffer a little bit here, but the S8 Plus is one of the best performers indoors. Detail, not too fantastic. Samsung does apply, ag apply aggressive post-processing noise reduction filters. So if you're zooming in, you will see some of the oil painting effect here, which is a bit disappointing. But in terms of its you know, color performance, photos are vibrant. They look great. They tend to be well metered unless you're in a cloudy situation or you're in tricky indoor lighting situations. Some of my photos were tinted a bit red uh, in indoor situations and looked a bit cold if it's cloudy. But aside from those sort of minor deficiencies, you'll be getting great photos from the SA Plus. It's a very dependable camera. You point and shoot, you get great results. And that's what we've seen from Samsung phones in the past. One thing to mention is that I didn't think the photos from this camera were quite as good as I found in the Google Pixel XL. The Pixel XL has an incredible automatic HDR mode that just produces fantastic photos across the board. The S8 Plus isn't quite as good in the indoor situations that the Pixel XL exceeds in, 
but still very strong performance from the S8 Plus, and I think it's probably the second best camera on the market at the moment. You also get a great range of other camera features like your traditional slow motion modes, there's a hyperlapse mode. I was really impressed with the manual mode, you get to control a whole range of features, almost pro DSLR level here, looking at your ISO, your shutter speed, your white balance, but also things like your metering mode and also your focus mode, which we don't normally see on smartphones. I love having those controls in this particular device. 4K video recording on the rear camera. You can also get 1080p 60 frames per second recording if you want that. On the front, it's limited to just 1440p recording, but I was pretty impressed with the front-facing camera. This has been upgraded from the S7 Edge to an eight megapixel sensor with autofocus and an f1.7 lens. You get some pretty decent background blur in your selfies from this camera and improved low light performance. I love seeing companies focus on the selfie performance in low light, and the S8 Plus succeeds pretty well in this regard. Software is always a contentious issue when it comes to Samsung devices, because I know a lot of people out there don't like their touch Touchwiz interface atop Android 7.0, but I think they've made some pretty decent strides in improving the visual style of their interface in what they're now calling the Samsung Experience. Apparently it's no longer Touchwiz, it is the Samsung Experience. Some of the things they've done across the board is make it look more professional, make it look more neat, make it flatter, reduced some of the childish and cartoonish elements that they used in their previous things, it's much more clean, there's clean lines, nice rounded elements, I really like some of the design tweaks that they've made here. It fits in reasonably well with stock Android, they use some elements from Google stock Android design here, though it's not necessarily the same and still allows the S8 Plus software to stand out from stock Android. Samsung has made a number of changes to elements around the Android interface. You'll see the notification pane use a vastly different visual style, but you still get pretty similar features like your highly informative notifications. Uh, you'll still get your quick setting toggle split into two settings along with a brightness slider. Samsung has cut down on the unnecessary crap here in favor of just the elements you need, which is pretty decent. The settings screen has also been changed significantly with the simplified design making it far easier to navigate than any previous Samsung handset. Love the condensed sub-menus here, and they even give you a few tips to try and make it easier to navigate through the sections if you happen to stumble into the wrong area. There are also a lot of features throughout the software. I'm not going to discuss everything because some of the stuff we've seen in previous Galaxy S7 devices and so forth, things like your app notification blocker, full theming support, there's a one-handed mode, gesture support, and even a game launcher for things like improving performance and you know capturing some in-game footage on the handset itself. There's even a new maintenance tool that makes it easy to do things like manage your battery life and storage, turn on performance mode, secure your handset, and so forth. I like seeing tools like that included, and it's a nice way to condense all that information into the one easy-to-use utility. Bloatware isn't as much of an issue on the S8 Plus because during the setup utility, you can choose to not install a bunch of unnecessary crap like their duplicate internet browser, S Health, and so forth. Uh, I really like that feature, actually. I wish more companies would choose to rid yourself of the bloatware in their setup utility. However, there are still a number of bloatware and unnecessary apps, in my opinion, included on this phone. There is a duplicate gallery app, and most notably, Galaxy Apps. Um, I don't know why Samsung feels the need to include their own app store on the S8 Plus, uh, Google Play is a perfectly fine utility, Samsung. Just update your apps through uh, the Google Play Store, please. I don't need to see Galaxy apps on this phone. There's a few other bits of bloatware here and there as well. Not the cleanest Android experience going around, but Samsung are making some improvements in that regard. The edge screen is still a feature included on the S8 Plus. Apparently Samsung thinks you need a curved display for the edge screen, but really it could be implemented easily on a flat screen. Anyway, uh, you simply swipe in from the right of the display to bring up the edge screen. It's got app shortcuts to apps that you use frequently. There's some contacts that you might want to you know, speed dial in there. And perhaps the most useful feature is some of its screenshotting utility, but to be honest, the edge screen got in the way more than it helped me out throughout my time using the S8 Plus, and I pretty much just disabled it from the get-go. It's not too useful. Another feature I didn't find too useful was Bixby, which is the main new software inclusion on the S8 Plus, but to be honest, it's a pretty straightforward clone of both Google Now and Assistant. It doesn't add a whole lot of new functionality that couldn't have been achieved through implementing either of those features. You do get Google Assistant on this handset. It is a far better option for voice searching from what I've heard, although I can't actually use Bixby Voice in Australia. It's not included here just yet. 
Bixby Home is included on the leftmost pane of the home screen. It includes things like your calendar reminders, weather, some news information, reminders, so forth in there. These are all things that we've seen before in Google now. It doesn't really add a whole lot to the experience there. And Bixby Vision, um, the easiest way to categorize this is it's similar to Google Goggles back in the day. You know, you point your camera at something, it tries to identify, it tries to show you information. Uh, a bit more of a gimmick than useful. Um, I wouldn't go around, you know, using Bixby Vision on things every single day. So yeah, a bit of a gimmick there. Not too impressed with Bixby overall, but at least Samsung, you know, they're trying something new. They're trying to compete with uh, Google Assistant, but pretty much just use Google Assistant if you needed that functionality. Unfortunately, Samsung thought that Bixby would be so useful that they included a dedicated button for it on the left-hand side of the phone. Uh, the amount of times I've used this button is probably once, just to test that it actually worked, because unfortunately, you can't remap it to something useful. I'd really love it if you could remap the Bixby button to your favorite app, or even something more useful like Google Assistant, but, uh, you can't on the S8 Plus without a third party utility and that's pretty disappointing. If you're including a dedicated button that could be remapped to something Samsung, you should allow us to remap it. That's good user practice, but unfortunately you can't do it on the S8 Plus, uh, much to my disappointment. So if you've made it all the way through my Galaxy 8 Plus review to the end here, let's recap what I think is awesome in this handset. So the design, it looks fantastic. It looks futuristic with that display occupying almost all of the front panel. The build quality is immaculate. And you know, other manufacturers will really need to step up their game and produce more zero bezel handsets because this is where the design trend is heading. And this, you know, futuristic design makes all other phones look pretty crap in my opinion. The display itself, Super AMOLED, looks awesome. Great viewing angles, great brightness, great resolution. Looks vibrant and oversaturated in general, which I know a lot of people like. Fantastic performance from the Exynos 8895, even though it throttles at some situations. Great battery life once again. The camera is fantastic, produces excellent photos almost across the board thanks to some minor tweaks and focusing speeds are still very fast. Doesn't quite come to the same level as the Pixel XL, but coming in second best is still a fantastic feat as far as cameras are concerned. We're still seeing some great tweaks to the software. It's improving TouchWiz every year. Even though bloatware is still an issue, Bixby doesn't add a whole lot to the experience and we're still getting the pretty useless edge screen, but there's a lot of features packed in to the Galaxy S8 Plus that some people will find useful. The main downsides to this phone are the horrible position of the fingerprint sensor on the back and the fact that it's pretty much the most fragile phone ever made. You're gonna need to put on a case on this phone so that it doesn't shatter when you drop it for the first time. And that's a disappointing aspect really because they've made one of the most beautiful designs ever as far as smartphones are concerned but they haven't made it sturdy enough for everyday use. If you're one of the people that loves putting cases on your phones anyway, by all means, go out and buy the S8 Plus and enjoy the excellent functionality and features that it provides. But if you rather use your phones without a case, you wanna see the beauty of the handset, you don't want the extra bulk and unattractiveness that is provided by a case, then perhaps the S8 Plus isn't for you and you should look on the market for some of the other options like the LG G6 and other phones that are coming up in the coming months. So that's my main takeaway here. Buy the S8 Plus if you like using the case. Don't buy it if you think it's too fragile. And yeah, check out the full review on techspot.com with all the benchmarks in there. We're finally at the end of the video. Thanks everyone for watching the whole way through. If you like this video, definitely consider supporting us through our Patreon and we'll catch you in the next one.